Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here among so many distinguished scholars, including some of the people who made possible the work that I did as a graduate student 30 years ago, starting out in the field of American and European philosophy and political theory, and also to see many others who continue to show how rich these traditions are. William James usually tended more towards self-deprecation than towards self-aggrandizement. Yet writing to his brother Henry a century ago this month, on May 4th, 1907, William characterized his then new book, Pragmatism, with surprising enthusiasm. It was an unconventional utterance, William conceded, but he nevertheless predicted what he called the definitive triumph of the general way of thinking laid out in the book, and he characterized the overall cultural change it would bring as something quite like the Protestant Reformation. So what did he mean? How does his prophecy look a century after the publication of Pragmatism? Did the 20th century, particularly in the field of social thought, witness the transformation that he anticipated? In my remarks today, I'm going to focus on a number of different domains, including domestic and international politics, race and ethnicity, and very briefly, law. In the second half of the much longer paper from which these remarks are taken, I also discuss more recent developments in the fields of business management, architecture and urban planning, medicine, gender discrimination law, education, and environmentalism. Any of you who are more interested in this century than you are in the last century should either send me a message or an email, and I'll be happy to send a copy of that paper to you. I undertake this survey with some wariness because William also wrote to his brother Henry another letter in which he complained that some readers of pragmatism seemed to think that the book was, in William's words, got up for the use of engineers, electricians, and doctors, whereas it really grew up from a more subtle and delicate theoretic analysis of the function of knowing. Now, it's a cliche that Americans are a pragmatic people, and I don't want to be understood as claiming that James... James's direct influence has been decisive in any of these domains. But neither should it be assumed that outside the community of academic philosophers, all references to James are uninformed or meaningless. And I take for granted that James's more subtle and delicate analysis will receive adequate attention in this conference. My goal here is to sketch, because in a little over an hour it's not possible to do more than just sketch, some indications of the immediate impact of pragmatism in the first 20 years of the last century, and then to gesture briefly in my conclusion to the longer-term legacies of pragmatism in American social thought. I will not discuss the undeniable impact of James's pragmatism in literature or the arts, even though some of the most important writers and artists of the 20th century expressed their debts to pragmatism. That's a story for another time and probably for another storyteller. Well, enough preliminaries. Evidence indicating the influence of pragmatism on American politics in the early 20th century is complex, but it is unmistakable. Some of it is only now coming to light because philosophers have tended not to study political history and political historians have tended not to study philosophy. At the high watermark of the progressive era of reform, the presidential election of 1912, both the platforms of the Progressive Party of Theodore Roosevelt and the Democratic Party of Woodrow Wilson reflected the impact of James's ideas. James and Roosevelt had a history. They became acquainted during TR's sophomore year at Harvard in 1877-78, when he took James's course, Comparative Anatomy and Physiology of Vertebrates, as part of his career, his plan for a career in science. The conference in, the, in this conference on James as a philosopher, we might be inclined to forget that he was, after all, hired with his MD in hand to teach physiology and anatomy at Harvard College. During that year of 77-78, when the death of TR's father plunged the young man into a depression that he worked through with outbursts of various kinds, he engaged in spirited exchanges with James of the sort for which he later became famous. James initially found TR's pugnacity amusing, but when it matured into imperialism two decades later, he would denounce his former student. 
James's anti-imperialism, which has been mentioned a couple of times already, deserves our attention now at a time when our nation is wrestling with the agonizing consequences of another war justified on terms vaguely reminiscent of those used a century ago, and to many of us at least terms equally dubious. Another war that seemed to its architects and salesmen to begin so gloriously and that has spiraled tragically downward ever since. In that letter to the Boston Evening Transcript on March 1st, 1899, James condemned his nation for su suppressing indigenous forces in the Philippines at the end of the Spanish-American War. We are now, James wrote, openly engaged in crushing out the sacredest thing in this great human world, the attempt of a people long enslaved to attain to the possession of itself, to organize its laws and government, to be free to follow its internal destinies according to its own ideals. Well, T.R., the hero of the Battle of San Juan Hill, was not persuaded. And a month later, he defended American policy in his speech, The Strenuous Life. That speech, in turn, prompted James to respond again to the Boston Evening Transcript six weeks later with words that can be read as an early draft of pragmatism. American imperialism was born of an abstract doctrine of national strength, James wrote, a doctrine conceived without ever taking into account the people of Cuba or the Philippines, in his words, face to face as a concrete reality, a doctrine never subjected to critical scrutiny. The position celebrated by TR illustrated just the sort of thinking that James was later to criticize in pragmatism. Of all the naked abstractions that were ever applied to human affairs, James wrote, the outpourings of Governor Roosevelt's soul in this speech would seem the very nakedest. T.R., James wrote, seemed frozen in early adolescence, which was, of course, the state in which James had first encountered him. He gushes over war, James continued, as the ideal condition of human society for the manly strenuousness which it involves and treats peace as a condition of blubber-like and swollen ignobility. Why such judgments about war and peace? Well, James pointed out, T.R. never really felt the need to give his reasons. Not a word of the cause. One foe is as good as another, for aught he tells us. Not a word of the conditions of success. James's fury seethed through his concluding words. To enslave a weak but heroic people or to brazen out a blunder is a good enough cause, it appears, for Colonel Roosevelt. To us Massachusetts anti-imperialists who have fought in better causes, it is not quite good enough. James's readers would have known what cause he meant, the cause of the Union in the Civil War. Two years just before his exchange with TR, James had delivered a speech at the dedication of the monument to Robert Gould Shaw and the Massachusetts 54th, the regiment of African-American soldiers that included among its officers James's younger brother, Wilkie the regiment that was sacrificed in the bloody and futile battle of Fort Wagner. That is, of course, the regiment celebrated in the splendid film Glory. And if any of our out-of-town guests have not seen the St. Gaudens bas-relief dedicated 110 years ago, it's just four stops from Harvard Square on the red line at the edge of the Boston Common across Beacon Street from the State House, and it's worth your time tomorrow afternoon if you have a chance to make the trip. Reflecting on the difference between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War, James was sickened by TR's glorification of war for no purpose other than the hollow abstraction of national greatness. The nation needed no such pointless displays. It needed instead the more rare civic courage of the soldiers of the 54th, who gave their lives in service to an ideal of justice, not a fantasy of imperial might. That quality of civic virtue, shown by those who put the common good above their own narrow self-interest, was the sensibility that fueled the progressive reform movement at its best. At the turn of the 20th century, James and his fellow anti-imperialists stood apart from the mainstream of American public life, but things were changing. By 1912, the ideas of, prog of pragmatism were making a difference. Through James's former student, Herbert Crowley, whose book, The Promise of American Life, shaped TR's Bull Moose campaign, and through James's friend and Wilson's advisor, Louis Brandeis, a legal pragmatist known as the people's lawyer, James's social and political sensibility was helping to set the tone of domestic political debates during the crucial years before America's entry into World War I. 
the progressive reform movement with its origins in the Wisconsin idea of consumer protection, economic regulation, and the graduated income tax spread and transformed public life at every level. Progressivism was a complex, multi-dimensional phenomenon, but in all its dimensions, it represented a, del a deliberate departure from the ideas of laissez-faire and revolutionary Marxism and a conscious commitment to incremental reform and democratically guided experimentation in public policy. I've written a very long book about the philosophy of pragmatism and the politics of progressivism, but here let me try to make the point very briefly by looking just at two of James's students and self-proclaimed disciples, Herbert Crowley and Walter Lippmann. Crowley wrote two books that helped shape the progressive agenda at the national level. When The Promise of American Life was published in 1909, it was reviewed enthusiastically by Teddy Roosevelt, and the book won Crowley, Crowley a prominent place on the committee that wrote the Progressive Party's platform in 1912. When Crowley joined with the economist Walter Weil and another of James's former students, Walter Lippmann, to become the founding editors of the New Republic in 1914, they made no secret of their commitment to pragmatism. Crowley made that commitment even more explicit in his book, Progressive Democracy, published in 1914. Democracy, Crowley wrote there, assumes an intrepid and inexhaustible faith in an ideal of individual and social fulfillment. It assumes the ability of the human will, both in its individual and its collective aspects, to make an effective contribution to the work of fulfillment. It assumes the ability of the human intelligence to frame temporary programs which will provide a sufficient foundation for significant and fruitful action. As Crowley himself put it, his vision of democracy was necessarily opposed to intellectualism and allied to pragmatism. That was true for several reasons. Crowley agreed with James that knowledge is never simply a reflection of the world outside ourselves. It inevitably contains a fiduciary element Verifying our beliefs in the political realm requires us to experiment and, in James's phrase, to trade on each other's truth. Neither this pragmatic knowledge nor the sort of progress stemming from it is automatic. It must be tested constantly, and the results must be evaluated critically through the already admittedly imperfect mechanisms of democracy. The classic example of the progressive's pragmatist approach was the regulatory agency. Staffed by experts trained in the best techniques of natural science and social science, committed to experimentation and to the tough-minded and ideally nonpartisan assessment of results, and answerable to the public, whose arm it was understood to be. The regulatory agencies created by progressive reformers were hardly panaceas. They were never intended or expected to be. Progressives urged discarding all inherited formulas and testing proposals in practice thereby transmitting to a wider audience the ideas advanced by Crowley and by the precocious Lippmann, Lippmann in the two most Jamesian of his books, the 1913 Preface to Politics and Drift in Mastery, published the following year. As Lippmann explained to his English friend, the Fabian socialist Graham Wallace, his aim in a preface to politics was to demonstrate the fruitfulness for politics of James's idea of uncertainty. Paraphrasing James, Lippmann contended that the great difficulty in all complicated thinking is to understand the concept that the concept is a rough instrument that we use when we lack adequate perception. James always felt, Lippmann continued in that letter to Wallace, that the epistemological problem especially has tremendous consequences for political practice. As Lippmann put it, we can no longer expect to meet our problems with a few inherited ideas and uncriticized assumptions. Instead, in his words, our primary care must be to keep the habits of mind flexible and adapted to the movement of real life, precisely the argument that was at the center of James's pragmatism. Lippmann's book, Drift and Mastery, was his plea for using the capacities of government to investigate and solve problems rather than shackling it to the dictates of left or right-wing ideologies. Scientific research could generate reliable information and educated public servants attuned to Jamesian ideas might apply that knowledge to experiments designed to ameliorate the unprecedented problems facing an industrializing and urbanizing culture. Rightly understood, Lippmann wrote, science is the culture under which people can live forward in the midst of complexity.
and treat life not as something given, but as something to be shaped. Although Lippmann, after World War I, came to doubt the capacity of the people to think either pragmatically or even responsibly, his early writings showed greater confidence in democracy because Lippmann equated democracy with science. In his words, there is nothing accidental then in the fact that democracy and politics is the twin brother of scientific thinking. They had to come together. As absolutism falls, democracy arises. When the impulse which overthrows kings and priests and unquestioned creeds becomes self-conscious, we call it science. Lippmann did not promise easy answers. To the contrary, he offered pragmatic experimentation. The only rule to follow, he wrote, is that of James. Use concepts when they help and drop them when they hinder understanding. In other words, mastery in our world cannot mean any single neat and absolute line of procedure. Perhaps surprisingly, given James's earlier criticism of Roosevelt, Crowley and Lippmann both preferred Roosevelt to Wilson in 1912. They judged Wilson a less attractive candidate because they worried that his apparent commitment to small, decentralized government might rule out some of the experiments with economic regulation that Roosevelt seemed willing, sometimes even eager, to try. For that reason, their shift to supporting Wilson after he became president surprised many of those who knew them or who read them. But consistent with their pragmatism, the editors of the New Republic turned enthusiastic when Wilson proved less doctrinaire and much more willing to explore unconventional pathways than they had anticipated. In fact, Wilson's domestic policies during his first term in office came much closer to the programs of Crowley's Progressive Party platform than to the Jeffersonian slogans of many of the Democrats Wilson had courted to win his party's nomination. Wilson's commitment as president to the quintessential progressive economic reforms, the graduated income tax and independent regulatory agencies such as the Federal Trade Commission, should not have come as a surprise. It was Wilson's record of innovation that brought him to the presidency of Princeton and to the governorship of New Jersey, and that willingness to experiment likewise manifested itself in his domestic agenda as president. Wilson's debts are only now coming to light, largely as a result of research being done here at Harvard by a graduate student named Trigvi Throntveit, who I thought might be here, but he's probably bent over his computer, as he should be. From Wilson's days as a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, when he read and responded enthusiastically to the radical social democratic writings of Richard T. Ely, through his own writings about American government and his terms at Princeton and in New Jersey, Wilson showed a growing interest in experimentation that was masked by his stated respect for meliorists such as Edmund Burke and Walter Badgett. Most commentators have missed the precise contours of Wilson's admiration for such thinkers because their noisy opposition to revolution has drowned out their support for moderate reform. Wilson's familiarity with James's ideas has escaped the attention of historians more interested in Wilson's political maneuverings than in understanding the ideas that shaped his sensibility. Wilson cited James's will to believe in his own public addresses. His correspondence with his fiancee, Edith Ellen Axon, who became not only his wife, but the center of his emotional life until her tragic death in 1914, reveals the intimate acquaintance that both of them had with James's writings, especially his essays, What Makes a Life Significant and On a Certain Blindness in Human Beings, essays that exerted a lasting influence on Wilson and on his first wife. In the latter of those essays, of course, James had warned his readers against, in his words, pronouncing on the meaninglessness of forms of existence other than our own, and urged them to tolerate, respect, and indulge those whom we see harmlessly interested and happy in their own ways, however unintelligible these may be to us. Hands off. Neither the whole of truth nor the whole of good is revealed to any single observer. If Wilson's own ethics owed a debt to his first wife, Ellen, as his biographers have noted, both of them clearly owed a debt to William James. Those two essays and James's essay, The Moral Philosopher and the Moral Life, stressed the importance of yoking strenuous effort to ethical ideals. And they also showed James's acute awareness of the tragic incompatibility of competing moral principles. The decision is which part of the ideal to butcher, you'll recall. 
That sensibility manifested itself in Wilson's campaigns for political and economic reform. Democracy in an urban industrial age, Wilson came to recognize, required active intervention by government. In politics and in economics, Wilson became increasingly impatient with the inherited dogmas, and he became increasingly committed to the pragmatist principle of experimentation. The same qualities that attracted James's friend Louis Brandeis to Wilson, his rigorous mind, his uneasiness with the nostalgic agrarians of the Democratic Party, and his passion for exposing the excessive power of big business, ultimately won him the support of other self-proclaimed Jamesians, such as Crowley and Lippmann, and also the support of John Dewey. Last week, I got an email from one of the organizers of the conference asking if I needed any technical assistance for multimedia presentations. As you will have figured out by now, the answer to that question was no, but it did remind me that I did want to bring along a visual aid. Most years, I teach an upper division course entitled The World of William James, and in that course, the students read, among many other things, those essays, uh, what makes a life significance significant on the on, uh, on a human blindness, on certain blindness in human beings, and moral philosopher and the moral life. At the end of the last semester, in which I uh, offered that course, the students presented me with this T-shirt. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know what the letters at the uh, bottom of the shirt stand for, it's on the back. What would William James do? <laughs> Some of those students thought I should wear that T-shirt uh, for this presentation today, but I decided against it because I decided, after all, that it's not what William James would do. <laughs> so from that diversion, back to Wilson. Wilson's commitment to such an experimental politics and to the ethics of William James, which was fully consistent with the arguments of pragmatists such as Brandeis, Crowley, and Lippmann, is seldom acknowledged today, primarily because of the popular image of Wilson that has been so powerfully shaped by his disastrous failures in foreign policy. First in his ham-handed dealings with Mexico, then in the Caribbean, then during the Russian Revolution, and finally in his final tra tragic intransigence after he returned from the Versailles Peace Conference, Wilson failed to follow or secure the principles of democracy for which he claimed the United States was going to war in 1917. The reasons for his dramatic change from flexible experimentation at home to unyielding dogmatism concerning the rest of the world remain a puzzle. They involve political, psychological, even physiological factors much too intricate to discuss here. One might say the same thing about Wilson's ideas of racial segregation, another indication of the gulf that separates his sensibility from ours. But the doctrinaire, unsuccessful, and unwell Wilson of the post-stroke period should not cause us to lose sight of the pragmatist Wilson, who inspired Brandeis, Crowley, Lippmann, and Dewey during the six years of his, first six years of his presidency. Reading history backwards enables us to see Wilson's blindness and his blunders, and easy for us to miss the dimensions of Wilson's presidency that many of the pragmatists among his contemporaries recognized and admired. From the perspective of 1917, when the United States entered World War I, it was much less clear than it became later that Wilson's plans for peace without victory and a world safe for democracy, plans fully consistent with the ideas of other American pragmatist progressives, such as those clustered around the then progressive New Republic, would vanish in a smoke of resurgent nationalism in Europe and a fog of isolationism at home. But consider a modest counterfactual. If Wilson had remained a pragmatist at Versailles, if he had remained a pragmatist in dealing with Congress when he returned home, if by entering the League of Nations, the United States had helped prevent the Second World War, wouldn't his legacy look rather different to us today? Of course, the question of whether such flexibility deserves to be designated pragmatism is difficult to answer. In fact, self-proclaimed pragmatists could reach opposite conclusions concerning the meaning of pragmatism for politics as the debate over America's participation in World War I between John Dewey and Randolph Bourne illustrates. So does the difference between the positions taken on the war by two other influential and equally self-conscious pragmatists, James's and Dewey's close friend Jane Addams and James's student W.E.B. Du Bois.
Adams earned considerable notoriety and eventually a Nobel Peace Prize for opposing American participation in World War I and advocating international cooperation afterwards. Du Bois, by contrast, judged the war as Dewey did, as a way to establish a League of Nations, and for that reason he endorsed Wilson's decision. Du Bois also argued that honorable military service in the war might help African Americans escape the opprobrium of racism. Of course, no single individuals can be considered emblematic of social movements as multifaceted as those advocating equal rights for women and blacks. Even so, the self-designated pragmatists Adams and Du Bois played central roles in those movements. And if you have any questions about either Adams or Du Bois in relation to James and the war, you're in luck because the person who has written the best book on this subject is with us here today. Jonathan Hansen, who teaches in the Social Studies program at Harvard, has written a fine book entitled The, Pro the Lost Promise of Patriotism. And if any part of this, if this, if this part of the presentation seems at all unclear, I'm going to let Jonna clear it up for us. Jane Addams frequently invoked the importance of pragmatism for her life and her work. She emphasized the role that Dewey played while he was living in Chicago in shaping the programs and the sensibilities of Hull House, which was the first and the most influential of the many settlement houses founded during the Progressive Era. The lines of influence between pragmatism and the founder of Hull House ran in both directions. Visits to Hull House helped Dewey decide he should accept a position at the University of Chicago, and he often cited the educational programs of Hull House as models of pragmatist education. From 1897 until he left for New York in 1904, Dewey served on the Board of Trustees at Hull House, and Adams cited both his ideas and his personal influence in many of her speeches and her writings. Adams' relation to James was marked by a similar recipro reciprocity of influence, although it began somewhat later and focused primarily on questions of war and peace. In response to the American military suppression of Filipinos' efforts at self-government at the end of the Spanish-American War, James and Adams both denounced the injustice of imperialism and proclaimed the need to redirect bellicose human impulses toward less destructive ends. In 20 years at Hull House, Adams explained her hope that the interaction of different immigrant communities in American cities would breed a cosmopolitan sensibility that might, over time, make outbreaks of war less likely. In Chicago in 1898 and in Boston in 1904, Adams and James appeared on the same platform to advance that argument, and both of them understood that they shared a common conception of the reasons for opposing war. In her introduction to her book, Newer Ideals of Peace, which James greeted with admiration, Adams contrasted the reasons for her aversion to war with what she called the older dove-like ideal. She championed peace for explicitly pragmatist reasons. She believed in her words, the newer, more aggressive ideals of peace would be embraced not on the basis of a commitment to the principles of pacifism, but due to the positive results of developing what she called a moral substitute for war. James, of course, provided a similar, if somewhat more dramatic formulation of their common argument in the lecture he published under the title, The Moral Equivalent of War. Both Adams and James articulated versions of the same position. Given the increasingly devastating destructiveness of warfare and the apparently ineradicable human inclination toward conflict, 20th century Americans must find a different outlet. They agreed that war should never be seen as the appropriate vehicle for imposing our ideas or ways of life on other people. War, they agreed, should never be a choice, never an option. It should instead always be the last resort to be used only when all other alternatives have been tried. W.E.B. Du Bois played a role in the 20th century struggle for black equality no less central than that of Adams in the Settlement House movement, and he too explicitly credited James with shaping his sensibility. While a student at Harvard, Du Bois later wrote he was a devoted follower of James at the time he was developing his pragmatic philosophy and he credited James with converting him from the sterilities of scholastic philosophy to realist pragmatism. Du Bois decided to devote his own talents to social science and to journalism rather than philosophy. He became the first African-American to earn a PhD at Harvard, the only African-American among the founders of the NAACP, and the first editor of that, journal's, of that organization's journal, The Crisis.
Whereas many members of his generation derived from Darwin's followers the lesson that blacks and whites were categorically different, Du Bois took a different path. He reasoned, drawing on James and his other teachers, including the Harvard historian Albert Bushnell Hart and the German historical economists with whom Du Bois studied in Berlin, that all cultural forms and all judgments, including race consciousness, emerge from historical processes. For that reason, all norms should be subjected to critical scrutiny, as James urged in pragmatism, without preconceived or inherited notions about the nature, let alone the superiority, of any nation, creed, or race. Although Du Bois, like Adams, drew on multiple sources, and although the experiences that radicalized him after World War I carried him away from pragmatism and toward Marxism, Du Bois himself claimed that his, influ in, that his influential early writings and political engagement reflected the ideas he learned from James. James's pragmatism was equally decisive in the emergence of a multi-stranded discourse about racial and ethnic identity and cultural pluralism that has persisted into the present. From his 1890s Principles of Psychology, through his Hibbert, Hibbert Lectures at Oxford in 1908, later published, of course, as the, A Pluralistic Universe, James insisted that experience is inescapably social, and we might want to have more of a conversation about that later. That is to say, relational and value-laden. That phenomenological conception of immediate experience as social did not come into focus in pragmatism, but as John McDermott noted yesterday, it did underlie everything James wrote. It figured prominently in the work of his students besides Du Bois, who also addressed issues of color and culture, notably Robert Park, Elaine Locke, and Horace Callan, whose writings helped set the terms of debate on these issues throughout the interwar period. In his psychology, James claimed that selves are constituted within particular cultural matrices marked by particular constellations of values through interactions with similarly constituted individuals. In various essays, as I've already noted, James outlined the significance of those insights for America's diverse and democratic culture. Robert Park, after working as a muckraking journalist in Chicago and joining with Dewey on the short-lived progressive periodical Thought News, enrolled at Harvard in 1898 to study with James. In class one day, Park heard James read a draft of On a Certain Blindness. It made such a powerful impression on him that Park quoted it repeatedly in his own writing and his teaching and recommended, in his words, in preference to anything else that James or anyone else has written, that it be required reading for sociologists and future teachers. I'm sure there'd be many nominees for that designation, but in my own experience as a teacher, I have to agree. Park later wrote that On a Certain Blindness was the most radical statement he knew of the difficulty and necessity of overcoming the inability to see the significance of others' lives. Achieving mutual recognition, Park wrote, is a prerequisite, in his words, to communication in a society composed of individuals as egocentric as most, most of us naturally are. After Park completed his studies in Germany, he returned to serve as James's assistant for a year before spending 10 years working at the institution founded by the man who shared the speaker's platform with James at the dedication of the Shaw Memorial, Booker T. Washington. Park worked at Tuskegee because he considered it a radical pragmatist educational experiment, then joined the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago, where he worked to collect and disseminate data concerning American cities that he believed prerequisite to social policies conceived pragmatically and democratically. Among the many students Park and the other Chicago sociologists trained were notable African Americans such as Charles C. Johnson, who completed most of the work that went into his book, The Negro in Chicago, before moving to New York, where he became editor of the magazine Opportunity and one of the most influential figures in the Harlem Renaissance. In, teach in his teaching, Park had emphasized the unique role of the arts, particularly novels, in awakening the sympathetic identification with others that James had identified in On a Certain Blindness. In an obituary he wrote when Park died in 1944, Johnson recalled Park's insistence that his students understand and work to overcome what Johnson called that blindness to the meaning of other people's lives to which James referred. Johnson carried that confidence concerning the democratic reformist potential of aesthetic experience with him to opportunity, 
and sustained it as president of Fisk University. Johnson later wrote approvingly that Dewey, to whose work Park had introduced him, redefines faith in terms of attitudes as tendency toward action. Paraphrasing James's argument in Pragmatism, Johnson proclaimed in his words that adherence to any body of doctrines or dogmas based upon a specific authority as adherence to any set of beliefs signifies distrust in the power of experience to provide its own ongoing movement, the needed principles of belief and action. The pragmatists, in Johnson's words, urged instead a new faith in experience itself as the sole ultimate authority. And that was a commitment to flexibility that had already been, that had already proven problematic in debates concerning the relation between white and African American culture because of the inherited dogma of white supremacy. The pragmatist perspectives on experience and the power of art, not only to awaken sympathy, but to fuel democratic social change and to erode racial and ethnic enmity, also surfaced in the work of other writers directly influenced by James. Horace Callan, a rabbi's son who served as James's teaching assistant at Harvard two years after Park departed, became well acquainted with one of the students in James's class, Elaine Locke, an African American who insisted to the skeptical Callan that their racial difference should make no difference. Two years after, later, excuse me, two years later, Callan and Locke, both on fellowships at Oxford, forged a friendship from their shared resentment toward the white American Southerners who refused to include Locke, their fellow Rhodes scholar, in their Thanksgiving celebration. Callan and Locke were together in Oxford when James delivered the Hibbert lectures there, and they credited his pluralism with shaping their ideas. Consider a metaphor James employed in his 1904 essay, A World of Pure Experience, in which he termed his a mosaic philosophy. He then noted that whereas in actual mosaics, the pieces are held together by their bedding, in his radical empiricism, there is no bedding. It is as if the pieces clung together by their edges, the transitions experienced between them forming their cement. So thinking in terms of the diverse groups that make up American culture, one could reason, as Callan and Locke did in somewhat different ways, that the edges, the transitions, and the clinging together do the work. But James warned that the, warned that the mosaic metaphor might be misleading, for as he put it, in actual experience, the more substantive and the more transitive parts run into each other continuously. There is in general no separateness needing to be overcome. James's students drew a particular conclusion from these provocative observations. In the unstable hybridities generated by ethnic and racial interaction, at least according to Callan and Locke, can be found a rich possibility, the possibility for experience itself, in James's words, to grow by its edges. Just as, James continued, one moment proliferates into the next, so life is in the transitions as much as in the terms of connection. Often, indeed, it seems to be there more emphatically. That notion of identity as fluid captured the imaginations of Callan and Locke. Whereas most early 20th century American writers upheld a more or less static and vaguely Anglo-American Protestant norm as the standard according to which all immigrant groups should be judged and toward which all Americans should aspire, the familiar model of the melting pot. Callan, Locke, and Du Bois all followed their mentor James in challenging the adequacy and the accuracy of that image. They urged Americans to view identity as more transitory and the United States as the product of a distinctive and incessant juxtaposition, jostling, and mixture of diverse races, religions, ethnicities, and nationalities from which had emerged something new. The term cultural pluralism itself entered American discourse through the efforts of Callan, who was born in Germany and raised in an Orthodox Jewish household, and whose consciousness of his own ethnic and religious identity is usually identified as the source of his insights. But from Callan's own perspective, his pluralism originated in the commingling of the ideas of two of his Harvard mentors. On the one hand, the Anglophile literary critic Barrett Wendell, who alerted the assimilated and non-practicing Callan to the richness of his Jewish cultural heritage, and on the other, William James. In his first book on James and Henri Bergson, 
Callan adopted James's philosophical ideas of consciousness, experience, toleration, pluralism, and experimentation, from which he forged the theory of cultural pluralism with which he became identified. Rather than insisting that one's identity is always fixed by one's grandparents, to use a formulation now often associated with Callan, or offering his now equally familiar image of American society as a symphony in which various ethnic groups represent different groups of instruments, Callan at first sought merely to emphasize the distinctive cultural resources available to individuals from different backgrounds as they shape their own lives and help shape the culture in which they live. Far from essentializing cultural identification, in other words, Callan viewed it pragmatically. His later critiques of Zionism demonstrated that pragmatist sensibility. Although he endorsed the idea of a Jewish homeland, Callan bristled when he saw Zionism applied as a dogma or as a litmus test or wielded as a club by those with less flexible or pragmatist conceptions of the idea. Bloch followed a similar trajectory. Although he remained, to use his term, a reluctant race man, Bloch gradually grew to share Callan's appreciation of the particularities of individual racial and ethnic traditions. Indeed, whereas Callan's model remained Eurocentric, Locke joined with other contributors to the landmark volume he edited in 1925, The New Negro, to celebrate the distinctive contributions of African Americans to the culture of the United States. Sharp disagreements concerning the singularity of the black experience and the relative insularity of African American culture marked the debates among both blacks and whites during the 1920s, as of course they have ever since. But it's safe to say that the contributions of Du Bois, Johnson, and Locke all fueled by James's pragmatism, helped to inaugurate the 20th century African-American challenge to previous assumptions concerning the second-class status of African-American culture. Together with arguments from anthropology advanced by Dewey's colleague at Columbia, Franz Boas, and their students, Ruth Benedict and Randolph Bourne, all these writers used James's ideas of experience and pluralism to unsettle prevailing ideas of race and ethnicity. Since the 1960s, Bourne has often been cited for his critique of those who supported Wilson's policies in World War I. But during his brief life, Bourne was equally well known for his contributions to other debates concerning American culture. In his brilliant essay, Transnational America of 1916, Bourne cited Callan's work and presented himself as an ally in the struggle against the forced assimilation of immigrants into a pre-existing American mold. But the thrust of that essay differed from the cultural pluralism that Callan advocated. Bourne contrasted the cosmopolitan sensibility available to individuals who shrugged off a single ethnic or cultural background to the provincialism of those locked in a single enclave or a single way of thinking, those who thought their identity was fixed by their grandparents, or those who played but a single instrument or who played without improvisation, to use one of Cornell West's apt metaphors, from a fixed score with a director in an American symphony. Two decades of sharp ideological battles over multiculturalism have made the cultural pluralist Callan and the cosmopolitan Bourne seem quite distinct to us. In the context of early 20th century American culture, however, their shared respect for cultural diversity and awareness of the plasticity of identity and culture, as well as their shared debts to pragmatism, made their similarities appear far more significant than their differences. Certainly there were other routes leading to an appreciation of cultural difference besides the one that Callan and Bourne followed, but it is undeniable that they, along with Park and Johnson, Du Bois and Locke, emphasized the enormous debt they owed to James's pragmatism. John McDermott said yesterday that he didn't think James got America. As a historian, I'm not sure I quite understand what he meant by that, and I think I disagree with it, but that doesn't matter. What matters, I think, is that important figures in American public life in the early 20th century were inspired by what they considered to be a profound insight into American culture in the work of William James. In the time that remains, which should be about 15 minutes or so, and David told me I could take the full hour, so I'm going to do it. I'm sorry about that. I want to sketch in very broad strokes developments in social thought and in public life since the progressive era. During the 1920s, James's 
version of pragmatism, like many other aspects of pre-war culture, such as its optimism and its innocence, faded from the spotlight. Lippmann began his steady march away from James toward Aquinas and Du Bois from James toward Marx. Dewey emerged as the most prominent pragmatist philosopher, and through him, pragmatism remained an important influence in politics and loomed even larger in law during the interwar period. The next Democratic president to be elected after Woodrow Wilson was Franklin D. Roosevelt, who learned from Wilson's successes as well as from his failures. FDR shared Wilson's preference for piecemeal experimentation over rigid doctrine. The eclecticism of the early New Deal has earned FDR both admiration and ridicule as a pragmatist for many writers who would not know William from Jesse James or John from Thomas Dewey. But the evidence is now clear that from his election in 1932 until his death in 1945, FDR developed a firm commitment to plans and programs that emerged from the work of professional social scientists in his administration whose familiarity with and allegiance to pragmatist philosophy is not in doubt. James and especially Dewey were admired by some influential members of FDR's inner circle and by less prominent members of New Deal agencies, such as the National Resources Planning Board in particular. Dewey's arguments for experimenting with radical democratic decision-making filtered into some of the programs that took shape and many of the more ambitious plans that Congress refused to adopt during the 1930s and 1940s. I hope the trustees won't be after me, David, if I go ahead and have a drink. The failure of FDR's 1944 plan for what he called a second Bill of Rights, which would have committed the United States to policies of full employment, public housing, national health care, and other aspects of what, have come to be, what has come to be known as the welfare state, is clear. The reasons for the failure of that plan are complex. There's little agreement concerning why such programs were not adopted in the United States, especially since the GI Bill did institute precisely such programs for returning veterans, and most European nations moved rapidly after World War II to secure just such guarantees for all citizens. When the beverage plan was presented in England in the later stages of the war, Roosevelt complained that it should have been called the Roosevelt Plan because these were precisely the ideas that were being discussed in his administration at that time. But one thing is clear. Some of Roosevelt's closest and most influential advisors were led to their distinctive approach to these thorny issues, the proposals that defined FDR's 1944 campaign for re-election but did not survive his death because of the influence of James and John Dewey. Well, I'm going to skip the discussion of legal realism and law, both in and outside the New Deal, um, both because my voice is getting raspy and I, I'm sure that all of you are getting impatient. Of course, during this interwar period, pragmatism in politics did not go unchallenged. To the contrary, particularly with the rise of communism and fascism, critics of pragmatism charged that the flexibility prized by pragmatists opened the door to a pernicious relativism that made impossible the principled resistance to evil. James's death in 1910 removed his voice from these debates, but many critics on the right and the left charged that his allies and heirs, especially Dewey, were guilty of having sapped the vital strength of American democratic culture. Whereas pragmatists questioned dogmatism and urged experimentation, the struggles against fascism and communism persuaded many Americans that a dangerous world requires vigilant fidelity to fixed truths. Although through the 1950s, many prominent intellectuals from Reinhold Niebuhr and David Reisman to C. Wright Mills and Richard Hofstadter continued to invoke James's ideas, pragmatism became increasingly suspect as the demand for certainty became increasingly urgent. In the years since the 1960s, when so many aspects <clears throat> of American culture came under attack, the yearning for certitude and the accompanying temptations of self-righteousness have been particularly strong in American politics. That result was hardly inevitable. <clears throat> the early student radicalism that emerged with a manifesto known as the Port Huron Statement reflected its author's significant debt to pragmatism. In 
The faculty members and graduate students at the University of Michigan, who most directly influenced Tom Hayden and his fellow uh, founders of the Students for Democratic Society, were steeped in Dewey's democratic radicalism. The aversion to dogma and the commitment to experimentation manifested in the Port Huron Statement extended the central arguments of early 20th century pragmatists into the post-World War II world, just as clearly as did more centrist work of writers such as Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. and Daniel Bell. <clears throat> but that problem-solving sensibility stood at the outset in tension with a different set of impulses, of course, also present in the 1960s, a defiant repudiation of all forms of authority and an enthusiastic embrace of authenticity, understood as the satisfaction of all individual desires. The counterculture thus contained the potential for renewing the crusades of progressive pragmatists focused on the democratic ideal of egalitarian social justice on the one hand, and the strikingly different emphasis of the catchphrase, if it feels good, do it, on the other. That latter formula not only parodied the demanding ethics of James and Dewey, but substituted an easy escape from any form of discipline for the longer term project of validating hypotheses against the resistant stuff of the world, the bar against which James always urged his readers and students to measure all truth claims. Likewise, neither the Freudian left drawn to Herbert Marcuse or Norman O. Brown nor the various strands of the civil rights movement, whether drawn to Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X, showed much evidence of having been shaped by James's or Dewey's pragmatism. In more recent decades, the backlash against a now mythical army of dangerous 60s cultural revolutionaries has set the terms of American public debate. In the stylized framework of the post-1980s culture wars, the early pragmatists have been recast as cultural relativists who undermine the core values of American life. Whereas James and Dewey saw themselves as contributing to the fulfillment of the American democratic project, their critiques of dogma and their embrace of experimentation have rendered pragmatism subversive in the eyes of those who prize fixed standards and stable authority. On the right, the a reassertion of unchanging truths in the realms of politics and cultural, culture has generally meant an emphatic rejection of pragmatism. The unprecedentedly doctrinaire form of recent American conservatism that emerged with Barry Goldwater's 1964 candidacy for president and picked up momentum with Ronald Reagan's terms as governor of California and then as president has, of course, been surging forward ever since. In the presidency of George W. Bush, particularly since 9-11, we've witnessed the repudiation of evidence-based reasoning and the scientific model of trial and error, perhaps because such tests do yield evidence of errors sometimes, and only the weak would admit that. In place of experimentation now stands the increasingly brittle reliance on dogmas. At home, we must cut taxes and deregulate the economy to get the government off our backs, regardless of the consequences for our physical health as a nation or for those at the bottom of our unprecedentedly skewed distribution of wealth. Abroad, we must stay the course in the war against terror, regardless of the consequences of turning what should have been a police action against renegade Islamists into a replay of the Cold War. Challengers to these slogans elicit charges of allegedly un-American tendencies toward class warfare, or cowardice, or treason. To brazen out a blunder, you will recall, was James's term for policymakers' persistence in the face of a recalcitrant reality. To brazen out a blunder. <clears throat> Perhaps that phrase should still resonate in American culture. But during the past three decades, there have been few echoes of James's pragmatism in the increasingly polarized world of American public life. Efforts to criticize the status quo on pragmatist grounds tend to be met with shrill responses from the right and sometimes from the left, neither of which shows much interest in the strategies recommended by pragmatists, the frank admission of uncertainty, and the open-minded testing of hypotheses by trial and error. Modesty, tentativeness, and acknowledgement of the provisionality of all social policies have become endangered species in American politics. Echoes of James's advice about cultivating respect for those with whom one disagrees or trying to understand how one's opponents see the world, grow ever fainter in the escalating shrillness of political debate. For all those reasons, the late 20th century resurgence of pragmatism came as a surprise. 
Early in that resurgence, I was among those who hoped that the return of a pragmatist sensibility in the, Amer in the academic community might signal a new progressive movement. Such hope has become considerably harder to sustain, although every new electoral cycle brings a chance of rebirth. Perhaps just as significant as the return of pragmatism in academic disciplines, however, has been the proliferation of pragmatisms in different domains of American life. As I mentioned at the beginning in the longer essay from which these remarks are taken, I survey six areas in which forms of pragmatism have shown especially vigorous signs of life in recent years. These are the fields of business management, architecture and urban planning, medicine, gender discrimination law, educational reform, including the reform of the curriculum here at Harvard, and finally, environmentalism. Some of the people involved in these movements explicitly invoke James, others Dewey, others contemporary pragmatists, such as Richard Rorty or Richard Bernstein or Hillary Putnam or Cornell West. But all of them nevertheless claim the mantle and show signs of the continuing influence of the founders of the tradition. And if you'd like, I could sketch some of those developments either in the discussion after these remarks or later in the conference. I want to close by returning to James, specifically to a letter he wrote three years before the publication of Pragmatism to his young friend Pauline Goldmark. Writing to her in February of 1904, while riding the train from Syracuse to Boston after a winter storm, he began by painting a vivid image of our wild cold and snow, which for you younger members of our audience used to be the case here in New England during the winter. James then expressed his happiness that he was returning to the work that would culminate in the publication of Pragmatism. I am ashamed to say, he confessed, how much interested I have become in my own system of philosophy, with an exclamation point after it, since Dewey, Schiller, a Frenchman named Bergson, and some lesser lights have all independently of me and of one another struck into a similar line of ideas. James, I think, really was surprised that so many American and European thinkers were developing versions of what they thought of as his philosophy, the philosophy we now know as pragmatism. But James himself was already beginning to think that it might amount to something. I'm persuaded that, the, that a great new philosophic movement is in the air, he wrote, anticipating by three years the kind of confidence he would show in that letter to Henry with which I began. But he already saw, as we should remember when we try to assess the impact of his ideas, that tracing the influence of pragmatism is a tricky business. Philosophical movements such as pragmatism, James continued in his letter to Pauline Goldmark, seem ridiculously abstract in their original form. Nevertheless, he continued, they do filter down into practical life, even if it does happen through what he called the remotest channels. Well, no one familiar with contemporary America would claim the definitive triumph of pragmatism today, when the brittle dogma of U.S. righteousness dominates public debate and threatens to stifle dissenting voices. Yet, as I've tried to suggest here, James's ideas have indeed filtered down into many corners of practical life in America. <clears throat> in various ways, they continue to provide leverage for those of us dissatisfied, as James himself was, with reflexive celebrations of what he called that bitch goddess success, and with the allied temptation to brazen out a blunder instead of admitting a mistake and taking steps to rectify it.